for participating in this event, which, although digital, actually allows for a more permanent presence here on social media. I also want to thank beforehand the administrators and the creators of this event for actually accepting my abstract and allowing me to present my poster. And with that being said, the poster I bring here today, and which unfortunately you cannot see properly here in this presentation, is but a fraction of a deeper and more recent debate regarding cognitive archaeology and the compromise established between humans, between us and our surroundings. Now, the first thing I want to underline regarding this issue is that cognitive archaeology also deals with the temple where we, archaeologists, are living in. And as archaeologists, dealing with social sciences, we are or should be aware of what is it that our society is looking for now in the present. So, when we turn on the news, we see entire countries, communities, defending that their cultural identity is being threatened. And all whilst we're dealing with other forms of cultural expressions in our country, most of them completely alien to ours, and we question our role as individuals in our society. These are all things, and we know it, that aren't happening for the first time in our history, as we can see through the archaeological records. We know that the affirmations and reaffirmations um, be them social or ideological, were manifold throughout time. And one of the biggest, and the actual reason why we're here today, was the megalithic phenomenon. Large structures started to appear in the territory showing us today that they also dealt with their own issues regarding an individual's place in their society. And Although they all appear the same, structurally speaking, they actually reflect different ways of interacting with the landscape. Not just in the very beginning of the phenomenon, but throughout the various phases, through the centuries and the millennia. So, there is a lot of stigma that surrounds cognitive archaeology and many people, generally speaking, tend to fear these two words put together, cognitive and archaeology. Like I said, it deals with the necessities and changes and the habitus of our own temple, presupposes an inter- and transdisciplinary approach between archaeology, anthropology, psychology, linguistics and neurosciences, tries to understand or actually understands um, what lies in the core of human relations and the relations with a given territory or landscape and tries to understand the symbolic or to go a little bit beyond of the mere its ritual approach. Because if it is, what does it imply? And how can we observe that in the archaeological record? As social scientists, we are, like I said, um, or have to be aware of what is it that our society um, is looking to achieve so to create a better relation between archaeologists and the public, because I don't think that we, we are here or that the job we do every day is just for us. We don't do archaeology just for archaeologists, but we want to create a more, we want to create a bridge between the past and the present so that people can actually have a more general uh, or a better idea of their identity, of their cultural identity. And the thing is that that's where, where we see those 
really nationalist and extreme, uh, extremist thinking or uh, groups arising. We can have a job in at least giving another, giving another sense of identity, cultural identity. So, with that in mind, beyond landscape domination, why cognition is also out there, the title of the poster, explores what I explored back and defended in my master's in 2018. And I will here explain very, very, very briefly. Specifically in Portugal, one of the many problems that we face as archaeologists is the consecutive destruction of the native landscape and the flora due to massive eucalypt plantations. Although vineyards and olive trees are part of the problem as well. And that results in many archaeological sites being destructed and erased uh, erased of the terrain and whatever pattern, patterns of settlement uh, of human activity existed are effectively gone. And this is especially problematic for sites where there are no visible or durable structures like open air settlements or those that are more humble in the terrain. Which is the case? for the area here in question, central Portugal, more specifically, Serra de Lausanne, where we see a massive plantation of eucalypts and pine trees. So specifically that tiny black square. Altogether, so far, we have 10 tumuli. 10 tumuli were identified in Serra de Lausanne alongside the current main roads of the ridge. Now, in the current state, the vegetation is, we can't say for sure there aren't more, but it's possible that there may be more than 10. And to, to this information, I actually have to thank one of the administrators and one of the creators of this uh, event, uh, Dr. João Caninas, for the investigation in one of those tumuli. Only one out of those ten was excavated by Dr. João Caninas. It's the monument named Penedinho Branco or Penedinho Branco Alto do Marco. Due to time constraints, and this is uh, important to underline, at the time of my master's I uh, was not, it was not possible for me to conduct a more direct intervention, meaning I could not excavate. But because the monuments are nonetheless there, there is a relation that I could explore and study. The relation between the monuments and the landscape. I wanted preferably to talk about them before their eventual destruction actually occurs, which I fear it will. But how did I do that if I didn't and still don't have many more, uh, any more objective info? I ended up proposing a non-invasive, more theoretical approach in accordance to one, what we know today of monuments like this, because there are many others that were excavated and published in mountain environments in Portugal. Parallels and similarities between them, obviously. And the one and only complete investigation that took place in one of these monuments as a first means of comparison for that specific location. And from, from Penedinho Branco, we have a time frame, Bronze Age. They are really small, not exceeding 10 meters diameter, nor 80 centimeters height, built with local materials, quartz, granite, sometimes schist, but depending on the area, 
they don't have a funerary chamber per se, but a central space, in some cases more evident than others, just like these four pictures that I have from, from the poster itself, you have uh, a chaotic arrangement of blocks. Um, that chaotic arrangement of blocks may occur, occur to, due to the violations that these monuments uh, had or suffered, and the, again, massive plantation. Um, we would have nonetheless a cent central space. Sometimes, like this one uh, from Viseo, Casinha de Ribada, we can have a, a cyst like central arrangement, if it's not a straight. Their shell, their protective layer of small blocks has a predominance in white or pinkish milky quartz. All in all, they are flat and small and really humble. And because they occur in nucleus, the view of the landscape should have been quite interesting with these white-like dots when we would be walking through the ridge. But apart from the bibliographical work, the more objective and practical aspects of the monument's analysis, how did I use the theoretical line of thought defended by cognitive archaeology? It was through Lambros Malafuri's How Things Shape the Mind, which gave me other insights on some concepts that everyone has been using and that Tim Ingold also explored back in the 90s and still is exploring and developing to this day. And from those investigators, I focused on two main concepts, dwelling and material anchor. Most of us by now are familiar with the first concept explained by Ingold. And that relates to the gray area between us and the landscape. Meaning, a relational nexus where interactions can and will occur and onto which we can actively act, create, develop or secure aspects of our day-to-day -day lives. And it's on the relational nexus where we constantly create and compromise between us and our physical reality that cognition takes place. Meaning, it's not just in our heads. Now, the material anchor presented by both Edwin Hutchins and Malafurish presupposes a concept not so different from the representation argument, but it's not quite the same either. In fact, artifacts or monuments act as material conduits for chains of thought at a given time frame, just like my necklace has a certain meaning to me, but for you does not, whilst being the same object a necklace, or just like when I was a child, I was taught to count my knuckles and the space between them as a method of knowing which month have 31 days. What I'm saying yet is that it presupposes an action prior to the object. Like Edwin Hutchins says, the stability of representation, again, speaking of the representation argument that we love to use, is, necessary, is a necessary feature of the reasoning process, but it is often taken for granted. The need for representational stability becomes more visible in circumstances where the, necess the necessary stability is not present. And then, with the material anchor, 
o Edlam Rosmal Afuris, physical objects become material anchors, thereby enhancing and tightening conceptual blends in a memorable and durable structure. Uh, durable manner. Through this process, the material sign is constituted as a meaningful entity not for what it represents, but for what it brings forth. The possibility of meaningful engagement. And I don't have the time to explain you uh, this specific part here, but the possibility of meaningful engagement is where we can create symbolic things. When we are inserted in a social landscape with a specific cultural background, we will share the same ideals and ideologies. And generally speaking, we want to perform according to our peers. The things we make now, now, now being the now, the time of the megalithic phenomenon, or to be less confusing, uh, the things they did were a little bit more striking to the eye. And not just to the eye, but they anchor some sort of meaning that is conducted through an object, through an object or in this case, the monument. Malafurish also presents um, the concept of an activism, which is a, a concept used by biologists. An activity of an object presupposes, especially this part, the dynamic interaction between an organism and its environment. Now, how can we achieve this? Through our dwelling with social and physical landscape, and again, and again, and again, ad infinitum, be it today, or 20 years ago, or 200 years ago, or 2000 years ago. Now, if you're still with me by, by this point, um, and to conclude, there are some things that I have to underline again. A lot of people still look at the cognitive sciences with some disdain. There is still that stigma in the air, uh, saying that it is coffee talk, or that doesn't exactly bring anything new, or even that what it brings is an empty knowledge amongst another full list of criticism, which is legit. But let us not forget why lines of thought like this one arose in the first place, thinking again what I said in the beginning about us knowing what is it that our society is looking for in a more ontological manner, more social manner, a more symbolic manner. Cognitive archaeology doesn't presuppose that we should forget the advancements and achievements as scientists. And it doesn't take away objectivity or credits from any fact either. It's the exact opposite. Many investigators in the past have said with more general words or with a more generalizing argument the exact same, same things that cognitive archaeology now explain. Only now sided with what we actually know about how our brain works. Again, a successful link between social sciences, sciences and neurosciences. It has become insufficient to state that something is ritual or symbolic. Because, okay, it may be, it probably is, or it actually is ritual or symbolic. But what does it, what does it imply, socially speaking, when we confront with the actual data we have? 
if we are dealing with this phenomenon, then there are cognitive aspects that should be that shouldn't be cast aside, especially when we know that what came before wasn't like that. Especially when we know that there was a period with climate alteration that had major consequences in our social and physical landscape. And especially when we know that the megalithic phenomenon didn't last forever and stopped making sense, and people stopped making sense out of mega constructions. The tumuli, specifically this ones from Bronze Age. They are not mega. They are far from being mega. They are small, flat, and humble. Still, they had to maintain a constancy in size and locale. Still, they had to be visible. And this shows a behavioral continuity in rationalization of space. Only now, with a new sense of visual perception. Things don't need to be mega anymore, but we know they are there. And with this, I'd like to thank you all for listening to my presentation. Thanks again to the administrators, to the creators of this event, and a special thanks to my friend and colleague, Antonio Ativ, for the arrangement of this video and for the sound improvement. And with this, I hope you enjoy my colleagues' presentations and the rest of the event as well.